so confident they'll make the playoffs that if they don't, I'll wear a Giants or a Dodgers jersey on one of our podcasts. You don't need the pressure of, of always trying to perform here at the major league level, so that might be a good thing. He talked about the athleticism of this Padres team uh, last time out, and he just embodies it. Greetings, friends. Welcome to another edition of the BCSC podcast. We are live once again. It's the Best Coast Sports Connection. Andy Bishop with you here, joined as always by Brian Vilvin. Folks, I, I think today is the uh, start of winter, Brian. Uh, I walked <laughs> out of my house, rocked my San Diego State uh quarter zip jacket and was immediately met by like 80 degree weather at 11 o'clock this morning. <laughs> I'm here in the office, had to go with the AC for the first time in months, but uh, man, I guess we can't complain about Slam Diego. How you doing, Brian? I'm good. Yeah. I mean, I stay cooped up in my apartment, but uh, I still look down and check the weather app. And this morning I saw 77 degrees on it and I was like, oh yeah, that sounds about right. So after we're done here, I'll probably uh, venture outside and get a little fresh air or something, take advantage of uh, of the beautiful San Diego weather that we are so accustomed to here, and the reason we can't get away from this place. <laughs> yeah, love it. Well, we got a couple topics on the table today uh, for another podcast. We're mostly talking San Diego State basketball, got a a game to review and a game to look forward to. And then we'll touch on some Aztecs football news as well as college football as a whole. So the San Diego State Aztecs have looked brilliant throughout most of the early season. They get as far as number 18 in the top 25. They meet a tough opponent in BYU this last Friday uh, and were outplayed and ended up losing 72 to 62. They made a close game of it down the stretch, but it just wasn't enough. So they fall outside the uh, top 25 just barely this week, Brian. Uh, it was a rough, rough game to watch, especially that first half for the Aztecs on Friday as they were down 35 to 20 at halftime. Uh, they brought it back and tied it up at 61 with just two minutes left, but couldn't come away with it. What was your uh, a take from the game, especially that first half where they struggled, Brian? The first half was was very frustrating for sure. But um, we've seen first halves like that out of the Aztecs over the years. And there's just something that happens to San Diego State basketball in the second half where they turn it on. The opposing team has to go towards the hoop where the show is and the second half gets a little kooky in San Diego and the Aztecs always win the second half. Um, you know, they're down by 15. You'd rather be down by four if you're going to be down. But there was still this layer of, ah, there's, they're going to figure out a way. You know, BYU is a quality op opponent and it just felt like the Aztecs were going to get back in it and potentially win the game. And they did exactly that. They got right back in it. Uh, it took a Herculean effort, effort from uh, Matt Mitchell, but it was just unbelievable. I thought they were going to get it done right there at the end. And uh, one possession that really kind of messed things up there at the end. But to come back the way they did, trailing by a ton with just a few minutes to go, uh, I was really impressed by the way that the team battled and uh, the fight that they showed. And like I said, Matt Mitchell, I was ready to uh, erect a statue for him <laughs> the way he played in the second half to put the team on his back. And yeah, I was uh, I was disappointed with the loss, but pleased that they didn't go away, that they stayed right in it, fought till the end and had a chance to win the game at the end of the game. Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback on that, Brian. Mitchell, 26 second half points. So he scored 26 of the 42 Aztecs points in that second half. Uh, it really came down to it was him versus BYU in that second half. Yeah. So love to see the comeback there. But Coach Dutcher said it. He's like, it was not. It was for not. If you know, you end up losing the game. You get you get the L in the the column. Uh, I will go back to that first half uh, and, and dig in a little bit more. 
Again, the Aztecs down 35 to 20 after that first half. They just dug themselves too big of a hole. And it really came down to BYU being somewhat efficient offensively uh, against the Aztecs, something you really haven't seen against most of their other opponents. They were able to penetrate a lot, uh, kick out, get a couple threes, get some easy baskets inside. Uh, and that, I think, translated into a less efficient Aztecs offense, right? They didn't get very many turnovers. They didn't get transition buckets. That forced the Aztecs into just a lot of half-court sets, which they're, you know, they're an average team there. That's not going to be their forte. So that translated into a lot of one-on-one -on -one action, which, you know, that's not our strength, maybe with Mitchell, but outside of that, not really the other guys. And then you had Jordan Shackle, your leading scorer going into the game, coming off a 25-point game against Arizona State, and they absolutely bottled him up and frustrated Shackle. He was just never able to get into a rhythm, Brian. Yeah, he had a tough time. He uh, he missed his first couple looks early, and like you said, his his forte is in the transition game as well. And he's the kind of guy who spots up in transition and someone takes it hard to the basket, kicks it out to him. He gets a lot of open looks. Um, BYU did bottle him up. They played really good in their half court defensive set. They played Aztec type of defense, just bottling guys up. And they've got some big fellas down low. So they did a nice job on the glass, not letting the Aztecs get a lot of opportunities for, you know, follow up baskets and uh, extended possessions. Uh, I was really impressed with BYU's defensive performance. A lot of teams will come out and give you 20 minutes of that against the Aztecs where they try to match that defensive intensity. But BYU kept it up most of the game. They gave it like, you know, 35 good minutes of that defense. And then, uh, you know, in the last five minutes, it started to fall apart and they almost lost the game. But it was, uh, it was the best defensive effort a team has come in and played against the Aztecs. And a lot of that, Andy, like you said, was limiting transition and forcing the Aztecs to be in the half court where they really aren't, you know, they're not built for success in that type of situation. Trey Pulliam had to do a lot of creating with the ball, and that's not necessarily his jam. Um, he couldn't really get a ton going. They just left he and a Guka rope alone for most of the time. So they were getting a couple of bodies on Mensa, Mitchell, Shackle. Um, nobody really was getting it going. Like Terrell Gomez came in. He couldn't get it going from outside. So BYU could just stack it inside and just dare San Diego state to try to beat him in the half court. And they just couldn't get it done. So. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a really impressive defensive effort from the Cougars, the best that we've seen against the Aztecs in a long time. Kind of the formula UNLV used a year ago to beat the Aztecs, uh, similar. But, you know, it also takes making a lot of buckets and, and the Aztecs missing a bunch. So BYU did a nice job. And they, they shot well in transition on their threes. So, you know, when you can have situations where the Aztecs go down, cast up a three, miss it. They get a quick rebound, go in transition, kick it to the corner, nail a three. That's a six point swing right there in 10 seconds. And that's the kind of swing the Aztecs normally have in their favor with a guy like Shackle posting up. So yeah, it's, uh, it was, it was rough. It was rough to watch. Yeah. You can make probably make the much case that the team though. I don't know. <laughs> No, it, it just wasn't wasn't their uh, night or their afternoon, whenever it happened, I forget. But yeah, um, I yeah I, you could make the case that, you know, BYU's defense looked more like an Aztecs defense than the Aztecs actually did in this game. Uh, and, and for me, it kind of begs the question offensively for San Diego State is who's maybe your best third option if Mitchell or in this case Shackle are having an off game. Who do you depend on? Sure, Mensa has been pretty solid down low, but you know if he's in foul trouble like he was, you know, can you trust a Pulliam? Can you trust a Gomez? Or is it you know going to be one of these other guys? You know, like a freshman Lamont Butler off the bench. Uh, I think that that has to be a question mark for the team going forward. Yeah, that that's the position where I would love to see a Keyshawn Johnson come in and be that guy. Um, ever since he missed that Arizona State game uh, with sickness or some type of COVID exposure. Um, he came back and I was just expecting 
something from him a little more he didn't do a ton sometimes maybe his feet get a little bit fast for him and the game speeds up i still think the skill set is there and he has an opportunity any night to go off for 20 points uh, so i think he's a guy who needs to be a more consistent performer and a more consistent offensive option for the aztecs moving forward because if he could be that, then that just opens everybody else up so much more. He has the he probably has the highest ceiling of potential on this team, and he's only realized some of it. But I think that the uh, the flashes that we've seen make you really excited. So yeah, I think Keyshawn Johnson's the guy that in that position could be the Aztecs to step up. Yeah, that would be certainly nice to see. Uh, Andy Bishop and Brian Vilvin with you here on the BCSC podcast. We're talking San Diego State basketball. So the Aztecs lose by 10. It really was closer than that, yep. 72 to 62 against BYU on Friday. Uh, they get uh, a chance for a little bit of redemption against the West Coast Conference team. Uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, they'll take on the Gales of St. Mary, a team that enters at 8-1. and one. Uh, so they, they've had a, you know, a little bit easier schedule. They lost their first game of the year to the, to, uh, Memphis. So they're coming in on an eight game winning streak. Uh, they've won against a couple of mountain West teams already pretty easily San Jose state, Colorado state. Uh, so this game is actually in a neutral location up at, uh, Cal state, uh, or Cal poly, uh, San Luis Obispo, Brian, any, uh, initial, um, impressions on this game going into it? Well, this is this is the stretch we talked about at the beginning of the year when the schedule came out, the, the COVID schedule. Um, this was the exciting time where you get to play against the best teams in the West Coast Conference, with the exception, of course, of Gonzaga. But you get Pepperdine, you get BYU, and you get St. Mary's. And for West Coast basketball, the WCC has been a team or a conference that consistently gets a couple of teams in the tournament. Sometimes it's up to three when you have a BYU and a St. Mary's sneaking in there with Gonzaga. So that was going to be the barometer, was playing against those teams, seeing how you do against the upper echelon. And St. Mary's is no exception to that. Like you said, they're on an eight-game heater coming in. So uh, this is a squad that probably feels like they're catching San Diego State at a good time. Uh, I would probably contest the opposite because San Diego State coming off a loss is incredible. And I don't have the numbers in front of me. I probably should have had that coming into today. But their record after losing a game is ridiculous over the last two decades. So um, I think we're going to see a revitalized Aztec team. But it's going to be a challenge, man. St. Mary's is very good. They've got a lot of really good wins. Um, you know, anytime you're 8-1, and one, I don't care who you've been playing against. And everybody talks about, you know, the schedules that the San Diego State types and the St. Mary's types play, but you still got to win on the floor. And, and St. Mary's has been doing a lot of that. And it's going to give the Aztecs some fits. So we'll see. But I'm excited. I just love that they're getting to play the game. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be a good test, uh, another good test for the Aztecs. Here's something I'm watching for, Brian. So – in that BYU game, it was really one of their guards, uh, Alex Barcelo, that gave uh, the Aztecs some fits defensively, and then he was really <laughs> did a good job at penetrating and setting up some offensive looks for the Cougars. So St. Mary's has a similar player, a guard. His name's Tommy Cousy. He's their uh, he's their leading scorer, averaging about 15 a game, averaging sit over six assists per game, and almost two steals defensively. Uh, so maybe a similar type player, uh, but I'm hoping that we see a little bit more improved defense from the Aztecs going up against a player like that. Yeah, and I think we got to see we got to see another one of those patented uh, Adam Seiko games where he comes in and shuts down a guard on the other side. Um, I think he's the kind of guy who can come down, come in and be a shutdown defender, and if you can make him one dimensional you're going to have a chance for success. So that's that's a guy who I'd like to see step up in this one, at least on the defensive end, is Adam Seiko trying to uh, limit the production out of the guard spot on the other side. The other thing, Andy, from that BYU game, 
uh, something that the Aztecs normally do and give other teams fits is stopping the run. So BYU was up by 15. We've talked about that. And then the Aztecs would get it down to eight. They'd get it down to, I don't know if they got it inside of eight. They might have gotten it to six at one point. Um, but every single time the Aztecs were making a run, BYU would get an easy bucket down low. That big seven foot three transfer kid, he got a couple of easy baskets. Uh, the blonde kid made a couple buckets, but they would always get a basket to end an Aztec run until the very end of the game when Mitchell went crazy and got the game tied inside of a minute. But throughout the entire second half, there's like 11 minutes to go, and it's like, okay, it's eight. Got to get a couple stops and a couple buckets, and it just never happened because BYU was always getting an easy layup, the type of baskets that the Aztecs got against Arizona State, where Arizona State couldn't get back in the game, and same thing with UCLA. And, um, and those are the baskets that Pepperdine didn't get and the Aztecs were able to make the 16-point comeback. So um, that's a thing. Whichever team gets up in this game against St. Mary's, will they be able to hold off runs and get the easy baskets in transition, easy little layups? Because, man, every time you're getting those twos when the other team's trying to come back, they're just backbreakers. Yeah, certainly a few defensive lapses, uncharacteristic. Yeah. Uh, for the Aztecs in that game against BYU. So, Brian, I think you can make the case in the Aztecs' six games, they've looked like a top 25 team and maybe four of those for sure, and maybe not so much against Pepperdine, though they did come away with that victory, and then, again, the loss against BYU. So the rankings come out today, the AP poll, they're just outside of it, uh, essentially the number 26 team. What do you make of that number, Brian? Honestly, 26 is, uh, it's higher than I thought we were going to be. Like I was expecting the Aztecs to plumb it out and nobody even be voting for them. So the fact that they're right on the cusp makes me think that maybe the Aztecs are getting a little of the respect that we were hoping for and that we didn't think they'd been getting. Uh, so that was encouraging to me still, you know, you think in, eight position slide from one game is rough but when you look at the history of mid-majors and the way that they're seen nationally i'd say that's pretty good i was thinking that uh they were gonna just fall way the hell out and we'd have to win 10 more games to get back in it doesn't look like that's going to be the case so if they win against saint mary's a couple of teams toward the bottom of the rankings right now lose and the aztecs are right back in the mix so um, I mean, I guess the voters realize that BYU is pretty good and that that win wasn't, or that loss wasn't a terrible loss and that their wins against UCLA and Arizona state were solid. And yeah, I, I'm actually pleased. I'm not happy that they're out, but I'm glad that they're only one position out. Yeah, I agree with you. So the, uh, the Aztecs, uh, look to get uh, hopefully a win to to help out their resume on Tuesday this week against St. Mary's tip off at six o'clock on CBS Sports Network. We'll uh, we'll transition to uh, the football team, Brian. Um, obviously, going into the the off season, the Aztecs uh, finish at four and four, uh, so kind of a, a mediocre schedule. A couple games that we thought they could. Uh, they could come away with that they didn't. Uh, so some news for them is they uh, signed 23 uh, to their incoming class. Uh, so essentially 23 freshmen. You do have a, uh, a red shirt coming over from Mississippi State at the quarterback position. And that, that's something you're looking at, Brian, is a couple of those quarterbacks coming in that are kind of that, that dual threat look. Yeah, well, first I'll just say on the, on the football team, if we had looked at it at the beginning of the year and said the football team was going to finish 500 and not playing a bowl game, we would have probably called it a disappointing season. But there was so much about this season and the uncertainty and the fact that they weren't going to play to begin with where we have to look at it and I see it as a success. Like, of course, you'd want to have a better record and you'd want to play in a bowl game. Uh, the team actually pulled themselves out of bowl consideration, so they just – 
said, that's it. We made it through this far. We're proud of the season that we had. And I am too. Um, yeah, on the surface, it's like, oh, four and four, come on. We have higher expectations. But they got through eight games. The players stayed healthy relatively. Um, and then we were in a couple of those games that we lost, played against some really good teams, took on a game on a Thursday, on a Thanksgiving Thursday against a Pac-12 team and went and played them on that Saturday. Like there was just a lot to to be impressed with. The team going up and losing at number 13 BYU, but playing them tough and having two turnovers in the red zone and two times where you're going for a touchdown and turnover on downs as well. So four more times they could have scored. Uh, they had quarterback troubles all year. And that gets to the second part where you were talking about the recruiting bit. We saw a little bit of what Lucas Johnson could do and then he got injured. So we had these glimpses and we're like, oh my gosh, imagine the Aztecs with an offense and a quarterback who can make things go and your eyes get all wide and you're like, oh my gosh, this is going to be something. But um, then we got these these couple recruits coming in. The one that I'm the most excited about is Will Haskell out of Arizona, out of Ironwood High School. He led his team to the uh, 5A state championship game. They lost in the championship. But to get his team there, they were the seventh ranked team coming into the playoffs, had a few upsets on the way to get there. And this kid is a stud. He's the one, if you remember, a couple years ago, a video came out of him doing like trick throws where he's like turning in circles and throwing. And it wasn't exactly football, but you could see that he's got a cannon of an arm, super athlete. Uh, the kid threw and rushed for a ton of yards and touchdowns in high school. We had a ton of his games on the NFHS network, so I got to see him a lot. And I'm really fired up about him. And then just as like a last-minute throw-in on <laughs> signing day, the quarterback out of Mississippi State, who's going to come in as a redshirt junior, so he'll have two years of eligibility. And according to Coach Hoke, he's going to be eligible right away. Or at least that's how they think it's going to play out. Uh, he hasn't gotten a ton of run at Mississippi State, but – his credentials coming in as a four-star recruit out of high school. He seems like another dual threat option. And to have him, Haskell, and Lucas Johnson battling out for time next year, no matter who's out there, it seems like you're going to have a major upgrade at that position and guys who are battling it out every day in practice just to get on the field. So I, I can't be more excited about that a place that's been kind of the Achilles heel of the Aztecs football team over the last few years. You know, the defense has been exceptional. One of the best in the country every year, special teams, always really good offense. We've always been able to run it really good offensive line. And our quarterback has just not gotten it done. So major upgrade there, super fired up about the Aztecs. Yeah. I love that you just, really few competition at that position to maybe give you a, a couple options there. Uh, running back Greg Bell as well, announcing that he'll be returning with the team uh, for the 2021 season. Uh, and you mentioned, uh, let's see, it's Jalen Maiden who's coming over from Mississippi State. It, like you said, it looks like he's going to be coming here for the spring semester uh, and he'll be able, he'll be available immediately. So I think for me, that's the, the thing this year, Brian, going into next year's football season is that in theory, we'll have a little bit more of a normal year to where these guys uh, will have their spring practices and yep. it, you should have a little bit more opportunity for a team to gel going into a new season. Yeah. Having, having no camp, having all of the COVID protocols and everything. And I can't imagine what practices are like uh, And the Aztecs have been known to have really good, hard practices all the time. That's why they're such a tough team. But, you know, I don't know what the restrictions were like. I can't imagine that they were allowed to just roll everything out the way they normally do. So this year has just been so strange. The spring was all over the place. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I am excited. I mean, COVID's not over. <laughs> so I don't know what this spring's going to look like either. But I hope there's a little bit of normalcy restored i hope they get to play the full schedule next season um we have found out very strongly this year that teams in the group of five 
are not actually playing for a national championship. So <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but there are still a ton of things to play for. Mountain West titles, bowl wins, group of six, uh, New Year's six bowl game, or group of five consideration for the New Year's six bowl games. Um, yeah, there's a ton that you can do. And I think for San Diego State, the sky's the limit. I just hope that they get that opportunity. Yeah, certainly. Hopefully in, uh, in time. Uh, just one other note from a local perspective in terms of that recruiting class. Uh, not much, much from the San Diego area. Just one player from uh, a San Diego County team, Jaden Brown, will join the team. Uh, a safety from Helix. Uh, and then you do have one other kid who uh, went to Cathedral Catholic for a year uh, before transferring up to modern day uh, in Santa Ana, kind of a one of the high school football factories here in Southern California. Uh, so it'll be good uh, to get a look from those kids uh, as well. Any other thoughts on the uh, Aztecs football team before we move to a uh, larger perspective of college football, Brian? I, I'm also just excited about the progress that they're making on the new stadium. One more year of playing in Carson, and then you come back down to your beautiful facility. Uh, I'm sure that's been a factor with the recruiting, um, just knowing that they're going to get to play in that beautiful stadium in Mission Valley. And the fact that the queue's coming down, and they're in the middle of building, and yeah, some of the videos and stuff that are coming out of there is pretty cool. So that's another thing that's got me excited. Only one more year till we get to see the Aztecs play in there. Man, we, we can't wait. It'll be nice to see a new stadium here in San Diego. A long time uh, wait for sure. Well, well, we'll end real quickly here, Brian, uh, on the national stage for college football. Uh, we've, we've learned the two matchups for the college football playoffs. A few teams that we're used to seeing in the top four here. Uh, Alabama, the number one seed, they'll host Notre Dame, who lost to Clemson 34-10 to 10 the other day. And then Clemson at number two, they'll host Ohio State. It seems like pretty much every year we see those top three teams almost. And then whoever the number four shoe-in is. Uh, but your, your thoughts, my friend. Here we go, Andy. So... Alabama, I've got no problem. Clemson, I have no problem. They won the ACC convincing fashion against Notre Dame, avenging their only loss on the season, a game in which they didn't have Trevor Lawrence. They had him for the title game, and they completely dominated Notre Dame. Ohio State, undefeated, only played five regular season games, plus their conference championship, but it is Ohio State. They won the Big Ten. They went undefeated. I'm okay if you want to put them in there. Like you said, just shoot those three teams in every single time and then pick someone else. That's what they do every year. Like it's Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State, and then add a random. Uh, a lot of times that's in Oklahoma or if Oregon goes undefeated in the Pac-12 or one loss, they'll get in. This year, the committee had a chance to put in the little guy. They had a chance to put in a Cincinnati, but they the entire time just forced against that. They're like, no, we're not opening this up for an undefeated team out of the American Athletic Conference. Cincinnati has been very good for a handful of years. In the AAC has been the best small conference, the group of five conference. And Cincinnati won seven of their nine games by double digits. They won their conference championship. They did everything asked of them on the schedule and they got docked because they are a small school from a small conference. And I just hate that there. There's no rhyme or reason for how the committee came up with their lists of teams. Like they had Iowa state who lost three games and lost to Oklahoma in the big 12 title game. They had Iowa state ranked nine places ahead of Louisiana Lafayette, Louisiana, had a win at Iowa State, 31-14. to They beat them 31-14, and they only had one loss all season. That one loss was to Coastal Carolina. Coastal Carolina went 11-0 and in the Sun Belt, which is Louisiana's conference, and won the championship. They 
the only loss for Louisiana is against a freaking undefeated team. And then they went in and thumped Iowa State at Iowa State. But because Iowa State is in the Big 12, they get to be ranked in the top 10. And Louisiana at 9-1, and one, only loss to undefeated Coastal Carolina, is at 19. And that's just not right. It makes no sense to me. Coastal Carolina, undefeated, beat up, not beat up, but gave us the game of the year against BYU. They took it on, again, kind of like talking about San Diego State, proud that they took that game with Colorado. Coastal Carolina and BYU weren't supposed to play each other, but they were these two undefeated teams, and they said, yeah, let's play. Let's do this. BYU came to town. Coastal Carolina beat them in a classic game. They beat everybody else on the schedule, 11-0, and finished 12th in the rankings. Makes no sense. Florida, three losses, way ahead of them. Georgia, a couple losses, way ahead of them. Cincinnati, eighth. Not even fifth, not even sixth, eighth. Notre Dame, we already saw that playoff game. If you're going to take a top four, don't take a team that just got beat by over 20 points and put them immediately in the final four. That's absurd. Texas A&M, we already saw them play against Alabama. They lost 52-28. to that was their semifinal. Get them out. Or that's their quarterfinal. So I think Notre Dame and Texas A&M should have just already been eliminated because they've already played against the teams in the playoff and lost to them. Get them out. Opens up the door for somebody else. Who's that somebody else? Why not Cincinnati? If there's any year to put them in, this is the one. It was a weird season. The Big Ten only played five, six games, most of those teams. Like, you have an argument to put that kind of team in. Instead, what's Oklahoma getting get in? Oklahoma also lost to Iowa State. They had two losses. Why not put a Cincinnati in? Let them get destroyed. I don't care if they lose 52 to 28 to Alabama. So did Texas A&M. Notre Dame already lost 34 to 10 to Clemson. Give Cincinnati a chance. Open it up. Ah. There you have it, folks. Brian Vilvin with the... Argument of the year for college football. (laughs) We're wrapping it up here on the BCSC podcast. Brian, I think plenty of people have this sentiment, and I certainly do as well, especially in a year like this where, sure, maybe the the one and two, you feel pretty confident in who those should be. But, you know, I believe it should be an 18 playoff. And I don't know if that's ever going to happen or how that will come about. But, uh, Again, especially in a year like this where there's a lot of uncertainty there, it seems like a small handful of teams should have a shot in a, in a playoff system. That's just me. Yeah, you've got 130 FBS programs, and only four of them get a chance to play. And honestly, only half of the conferences even have a chance. So you take the, the group of five schools, immediately those 50% of the 130 are eliminated. So you have 60 or so teams that are competing for those four spots. But if you're not in the SEC, then you have to go undefeated, hope that something breaks the wrong way and that every SEC team has at least two losses. Like It's just such a flawed system, and it bothers me. One of the coolest things about college basketball is the tournament and the fact that you have to – everybody has a chance everybody's in and then you play it out on the floor there are cinderellas sometimes and sometimes the the juggernaut team goes all the way and wins and we're like wow that was really impressive kentucky going 39 and 1 taking it all the way to the championship game undefeated i loved seeing that but they had to win their way there if we took kentucky at 32 and 0 and said hey you skip right right into the final four that wouldn't be exciting it'd be like eh yeah I'm getting off my soapbox I'm, now. I'm <laughs> right there with you, man. So who you got in the final, Alabama or Clemson? Uh, <laughs> Alabama by 30, probably. Probably. Yep. All right, man, that, that just about uh, wraps it up here on the Best Coast Sports Connection. My friend, uh, we are just about at the end of 2020. Can you believe that? <laughs> I can't. Man, let's get on to the new year. <laughs> It's been, a, it's been a fun year, though, for us, Andy. I know it's been a rough year uh, around the country, but I've really appreciated the conversations that we've gotten to have. 
um, between you and me and Thomas and Jeff and, and a handful of the people that have come on and been with us. Um, we've, we've made it through a pandemic and we're still going. We found new ways to be innovative, do this stuff remotely. And uh, yeah, I just I appreciate everything we've been through this year. And I'm glad we're still going and uh, as strong as ever. Absolutely, man. I, I share that sentiment. I appreciate you joining me here pretty much every week. Uh, plenty more coming from the BCSC in 2021. Folks, the conversation must go on. That will do it for this final episode of 2021, I think, for the BCSC podcast. Brian Vilvin and Andy Bishop. We'll catch you next year, folks.